Shalom Israel, this is Bishop Nathaniel. The Israelites have been scattered across the four corners of the earth, as prophesied in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter. Here in Israel, united in Christ, we need your help to recover the remnant of our people. Teach them the gospel. Please help us, support us, and join or donate to the Booster Club today. Shalom. Happy Sabbath, sisters. How are y'all doing? Happy Sabbath, brothers. How are y'all doing? See that? Let me try the sisters again. Happy Sabbath, sisters. How are y'all doing? All praises. I know what you quenched their spirit. Now they all. Uh, go to Isaiah 61. Today's topic we're going to talk about. I'm a, I ain't going to get on the women today. Sister, see that? I ain't getting on y'all. I'm taking a new route. I want to talk about how America is a reflection of ancient Assyria. America reflects Assyria. This is going to be a study of Isaiah the 10th chapter. A study of Isaiah the 10th chapter. But before we get there, I want to open up with Isaiah 61 first. This is something that uh, Christ read in Luke 4. And after he read it, Negroes tried to kill Christ and throw him off a hill, off a cliff, after he read Isaiah 61 down. But I'm going to show you something. Who's reading for me? You got it? Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So what we're doing is preaching good tidings unto the meek. The meek are those men and women who humble themselves to the word of Almighty God. Go ahead. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That's what Christ's job was. That is what our job is, to bind up the brokenhearted. Go ahead. To proclaim liberty to the captives. See that part right there? To proclaim liberty to the captives. When you read this Bible, you read about the children of Israel in slavery from one captivity to the next, to the next, to the next. And here we are today under the United States of America. Some of us in Europe or under Europe and some of other other countries. But read that part again to proclaim. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Because we are a captive people. Go ahead. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And we are bound in prisons. Okay, go ahead. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. You know, the churches never talk about the day of vengeance of our God. That day is soon approaching. Come on. To comfort all that mourn. And the day of vengeance is to comfort all that mourn. We are mourning because why? We are in captivity. We are uh, colonized, enslaved. We are brokenhearted. Go ahead. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. He's going to appoint to us that mourn in Zion. Go ahead. To give unto them beauty for ashes. Now that's the part I wanted to get to right there. To give unto them beauty for ashes. That's a heavy statement right there. Because the first thought is God is going to give us, we, we go spiritual right away. God is going to give us a kingdom. But I'm going to tell you, it's, I'm going to scratch the surface before we get to the kingdom. To give us beauty for ashes. So, if he's going to give us beauty, what is the opposite of beauty? Ugly. Mm. So you have to ask yourself, regarding the ashes, we have ashes. How so? In the, in the first context, we have been taught to hate the way we look. We have been taught to hate our hair, our complexion, the size of our nose, our lips. Everything about us, we've been taught to hate. Uh, I was watching a movie yesterday, myself and Captain Joel, 
And I want to show the clip. I want to show the trailer. Um, Alicia, show me the trailer of Adwali. I think his name is pronounced as Adwali. This is an actor. First, show me the, before you show the clip, show me the still image of his face so that we can see who I'm making reference to. I'm going to show you who I'm talking about. Watch this. I'm going to show you the beauty for ashes. I'm going to show you in one context before we get to kingdom building. I'm going to show you what it means to give us, what the ashes represent. You got it? Just show me his image. Any day now, any day now. Yes. Are you familiar with this actor? He played on Oz. OK. Yeah, that was Anna B.C., right. Uh, he also played in Suicide Squad as Killer Croc. He has a lot of things under his belt. But anyway, he is Nigerian from the Yoruba tribe. Uh, he was raised in uh, Britain. And what happened is there's something called farming out there. Now, you're from, you're not real Benjamin. You're over there. You're from over there in England somewhere. Y'all not real Benjamin there's over there. There's a lot there. of Benji over there. Benjamin. I know. But anyway, they got something called farming. I'd never heard of it. Cause he never told us about it. None of these other Benjamites we didn't mention it. Out. Y'all got farmed out. But anyway, to be farmed means, well, with Nigerians, they, they focus with them. How between 19, the 60s to 70s, what Nigerian families would do, it was they would pay European families, white families, to take care of their kids while the parents went to school to finish the education. So that is the actor. Now, so this, he directed and wrote this movie called Farming. It's a true story about his life and what he went through in England. Let's just show the trailer. I just want to show the trailer on this thing. Put the volume up so we can hear. Turn it up. Between the 1960s and 1980s, thousands of Nigerian children were farmed out to white working class families. Please take care He's playing the father's role here. That's his dad. It's just that until we finish our studies. Turn it up. Do you want to be mommy's favorite? The white foster mother taught him how to steal. That's him right there, that's him, out of a while. Man out of electric, all you gotta do is ask him to smile. Light like up the bleeding street. <laughs> look at him looking at his hands. Look, you see what he's doing? So this movie, Farming, is very, very good. I, I, before I realized it was a true story, I couldn't stand it because I said it was too unbelievable. I said, this is ridiculous. I, was, I just wanted to smack somebody. But it was a true story. They broke this brother's spirit. He hated himself. He hated all black people. He, didn't, he called the light-skinned black woman that tried to help him a black bastard. He couldn't stand her guts. 
They took him to his family in Nigeria. He was terrified of his own people. He felt only comfortable around Caucasians. And it shows this film, if y'all get a chance, look at it. It's very good. And it shows how he, has to be, he had to be retaught again how to just love himself. You know, it's a, it's a true story, a chilling story. J Captain Jordan, you want to add anything to that? Because you saw it also. It really shows you the self-hatred that lies within our people internally. And a lot of times when we reach, try to reach our people out on the streets and we see a natural, like I said, a combative spirit, we try to say, what, what, what's so difficult about what we're bringing out? It's very simple. Not knowing that there's layers of self-hatred that we have to penetrate through. So when we confront our people on the streets, we're not just bringing Revelations 1 and 14, we're penetrating to the level just to get them, before we could get them to the sense that they are Israel, they have to come to the identity that to relate, that they're first and foremost, they're part of us as an individual, as a people. Then once we break that chain, then we can bring them to, okay, now you're Israel. So this is, this is a good movie just to see the psychological mindset of our people. Hey, you know what's so heavy about this, Bishop? Remember yet last night I was showing you the picture of that. Remember that sister in Sierra Leone? That sister will stay in my, in my mind forever. That sister, a young, very young sister, she's about what, 15, 16, 17. She was coming from school and she see us teaching and she stopped. You can see she's bleaching. So, Captain... I think it, no, I think it was Officer Yui that was teaching. And she stopped, and Yui asking her, started asking her question, and she asked her, what color is Christ? She says, white. So Yui said, can you show me in the Bible? She cannot prove it. So we show her scripture after scriptures that Christ, not only Christ is black, or the apostles, the angels, she cannot accept it. So Captain Isaac stepped onto that white Jesus, she started crying. That's, that's the mice. That's how much they destroy her. She, at the end, she, run, she just, she throw the fly on the floor and she run. She cannot accept the fact that Jesus is not white. Because her mindset, she, and her mindset, her mindset is, listen, when it comes to black, black is no good. The good is only white. She cannot accept the fact. That's what I was saying last night. Uh, that, her face cannot leave my mind, my head. I feel like I feel sorry that for her that she cannot see it. She cannot see that, and she cannot prove it. She cannot prove Jesus Christ is white. We say, how do you know she's white? She said, oh, I saw it to the movies. Right. Hey, remember, she was shaking as tears was rolling down her eyes. Shaking. That's how she, she was furious at us, and she hated the Bible. It was, it was, it was, it's, it was heart-wrenching just to watch this, you know. So when I saw the film, like you said, that definitely brought back a lot of memories. And we'd be shocked that, the, like uh, Captain Joel said, there's layers of psychological damage that we got to peel back just to get to the core of them accepting themselves as someone great upon the earth. So we got a big job to do. We have a very big job to do. You want to say something, Captain Shemai? Okay. Uh, I want to show a officer, let's show the uh, images of Assyria for us, please. I want to show a reflection on Assyrian Empire, which took place around 722 BC. Okay, we're going to focus on King Sennacherib. Uh, you're, we may be more familiar with King Shalmaneser. Uh, there's King Sargon II. There were many kings. Um, as you can see here, uh, in Assyria, they had the eagle symbol there on the far left. That was one of their gods. Then on the right, you got the man with the bow with the eagle's wings. Now, go up. I want you to see the circle around the man, the, 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 the um, Assyrian man. There's, there's a circle of light around him. And you got the eagle head on the left. So now when we go down to the American symbol, go down. America has the eagle symbol. It also has that circle of, li of light around the hexagram, stating that Israel of today over in uh, the, the east is uh, a satellite for the United States. So you have the bird eagle wings, the eagle head. Now go back to the top again. Assyria had the eagle's head as one of their gods and the eagle's wings with the circle of light. 
So the, America took uh, portions of Assyria and set up and established their symbol. Go to the next image. Yeah, that's the uh, circle of light with the hexagram stating that modern day Israel is a satellite for the United States of America. That's one of their main bases. That's what that symbolizes right there. Okay, on the dollar bill. Go to the next picture. Next, we saw that already. That's the light. Mm -hmm. Next, oh, hold right there. Uh, this was the Assyrian Empire. They would put uh, hoops on our nose and hooks in our lips to control the Northern Kingdom when they conquered them. Um, and I, there's a scripture on that. Who knows? I think it's Isaiah 39. Bear with me a second. Let me try to find it. Hold on. Talk, somebody. Laba, talk. Nobody's talking. What the heck is this? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of times, um, going back to the movie Farming, um, like I said, you see the, um, the one um, part on the screen when he painted himself white. A lot of our people feel that way internally. They feel that they're white people. We're looking at them black, but they're really Caucasians internally. What do they call it? Um, Negro? Oh, Negropeans? Yeah, Negropeans. <laughs> Right. So, so, Euro black. So he's just showing us on the outside how he really felt, and they will do anything to fit in with the society. And people with that mindset are very dangerous because it shows you he was willing to hurt his do her damage to his own kind. We read during the time period of Maccabees is very like it says parallel during that time period and today. You had in the scriptures where it says many other people that hate their own kind. So that's in first. That's in Maccabees, right? Let's get that real quick while we're waiting for the bishop. Oh, I got it already. Oh, you got it. Okay. Get me. Go back to the picture. Thank you, Captain Joel. We appreciate you. Get me. Uh, put the picture back on the screen. This is how it's, what Assyria did to us in captivity. They and anybody they conquered. This is what they did. They would put hooks in the nose and in the lip. Get Isaiah thirty-seven and verse twenty. Nine. This is the, what the Lord is saying that he's going to do to the Assyrians because of what they did. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 29. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears, therefore will I put my hook in thy nose. So the Lord said, I'm going to put my hook in thy nose. Go ahead. And my bridle in thy lips. And my bridle in thy lips. Why? Because that's what Assyria was doing to us. Go ahead. And I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. So go back to the image again. So this is what Assyria was doing when they captured people, when they conquered them. Okay, so you know you had a lot of people with ripped lips and ripped noses. Okay, give me the next image. All right, here's another image of them with their foot uh, on our neck, on our back. Next image. Saw that in the movie. Right. Oh, yeah, you know what? Captain Amaziah just said, that's in that movie, uh, Farming. Right. That's exactly what Esau did to this brother. Exactly. All right, go to the next image. Let's shoot. Can we go to the next image? Next image. Next image. No, I gave you a bunch of images. I did not just give you three images. Nope, nope, nope. Let me look. I know I'm not going crazy. Oh, you got them. Oh, okay. I know I'm not going crazy. All right, these are the Syrian kings. Let's go. Next image. This is Jehu. Okay, bowing before the Assyrians. All right, see how they got their fringes? Yes, they wear their fringes the way Israel wore their fringes because we were famous. You got the eagle symbol, the bird image straight in the center, just like America. And they got the, uh, how many points does that star have on the right there? I can't see.
All right. Just like that's over America's head, on the, over the eagle. Remember, you had the hexagram. Let's go to the next image. Okay. This is Israel in captivity. Let's go to the next image. All right, this is one of the steelies that they found. And these are real uh, archaeological finds. Next image. Still, uh, Israel, this is Israelites in captivity. Next image. Blow that one up. I want you to take a notice at their hair, how they got the cornrows, braids. Let's see the head. Y'all see that? These are blacks, black men in captivity under Assyria. Right. And this is amazing because you'll see this, and then you get to comedic community that'll say such stupid things like Israelites never existed. So then what are these old, these ancient artifacts? And people just made this up. That's why I don't even give the comedic community an ear. Don't even listen to them. Next. Look at this. Zoom into that. Look at that. Black men in captivity. That's the technique called, they call it the peppercorn hairstyle. Next image. Okay, next image. That was the Assyrian army right there. Let's go to the next image. That was it? Okay. All right. Uh, give me Isaiah the 10th chapter. Isaiah the 10th chapter. We're going to start at verse, we're going to read verse 1 and 2. The book of Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. So Isaiah is prophesying about the Assyrian captivity, which was about to take place. There were three campaigns against they did against Israel. The last one they attempted was against the kingdom of Judah, because Israel had already been split by this time. Woe unto, he's talking about Assyria here, woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. So they made unjust laws regarding our people. Watch the next verse. To turn aside the needy from judgment. To turn aside the needy, which are the Israelites, from judgment, true judgment and justice. Go ahead. And to take away the right from the poor of my people. To take away the right from the poor of my people, the Israelites, go ahead. That widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. So, the Assyrian Empire had unjust laws just like America. Give me the first video regarding the 13th Amendment. It's a short video. I'm just showing you how just like Assyria had unjust laws, America reflects the same thing. Uh, Alicia, it's called the 13th Amendment video. So prisons in America specifically are um, some of the biggest, most dysfunctional businesses we have in our, uh, in our society. And they're business because of the cheap and free labor. When you read the 13th Amendment, that basically was the amendment that broke through uh, slavery and, and freed the men and women who were, who were enslaved at the time, there's a clause in there that allows for the re-enslavement of people in the event that they're convicted of a crime. And so in prisons throughout our country, you have people who are working for basically free. Uh, and if they're not working for free, they're working for um, wages that if we saw that happen in another country, we would be very critical of. Uh, when I was in prison, I worked for 17 cents an hour. Uh, that was my starting rate working in the kitchen. But there's also big corporations who invest in prison labor because they can get this labor for $1.50 an hour. Um, and then they, the sad part about it is that, in turn, they don't even hire these men and women when they're actually released from prison. Everything in prison has inflated cost. You know, it costs us inside prison, when I was inside, uh, anywhere between $3 and $15 for a 15 minute phone call. We don't have to pay that out here in free society. There's a, a way that we can send emails to, to men and women inside prison and it costs five cents every time we send that. 
Whereas out here in society, we can send emails without any charge. And so there's so many ways that the prison is exploited, uh, the cheap labor, the cost of services and goods. And it's a model that, you know, sadly and unfortunately has affected a large segment of our society. But I think most people aren't aware of why um, the business models of prison exist because most of our society has been left clueless in regards to how our judicial system works. And it's largely been to the effective campaigns the politicians have ran for years. This whole idea that one of the greatest fears you should have is crime in America. And when you're operating out of a space of fear, you're not thinking clearly. So you're not willing to examine things that are right in, right in front of us. And so the way that the prison system has developed and evolved over the year is it originally started as government-ran, state-ran uh, institutions, and then people start seeing investment opportunities when um, the states couldn't keep up with the budgetary costs of incarcerating so many people. You know, we currently have over two million men and women incarcerated throughout the country. And we represent 5% um, of the world population, yet we incarcerate 25% of the world's uh, incarcerated people. And so at some point, states could no longer keep up with those budgets. Private investors moved in and seized an opportunity. And then they started structuring laws in a way that ensured that people continue to be incarcerated uh, for the most frivolous things like, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't have as many laws on the books that we have now. And, you know, when you look at how the war on drugs itself impacted, you know, incarceration rates, you can follow, if you follow that pathway, you'll see how people seized on that opportunity to begin to invest in private businesses. So just as Assyria had unjust laws for our people, the leaders amongst our own people, we had the same thing. Now, this is, this is the reason the Lord sent Assyria against us, because just as corrupt as Assyria was, God's people, the Israelites, we was even more corrupt one towards another. So let's look at the next clip with Tim Weiss. This is an Edomite. Tim Weiss, um, I only want the first four minutes. Turn the volume up. Cannot do one one hundredth the damage of the not so usual suspects whose actions actually are far more contributory to our current situation and the global situation. So that wealth disparity has got nothing to do with merit, talent, intelligence, hard work, or investment strategies. It has to do with the fact that some folks had a head start. Is this the beginning of the video? Doesn't go okay, go ahead. Away just because you passed the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act. In fact, let's understand the real basis of that head start because this is clearly something some people are confused about right now particularly these folks who keep yelling and screaming about how they don't want the government intervening in the economy. And they don't want the government intervening in health care. And they don't want the government managing. They just want the market to control everything. They just want small government. See, that's, that's precious to me. <laughs> Coming from people who never objected to big government when it was creating white wealth, when it was creating the white middle class. Make no mistake, that is what did it. Wasn't hard work and initiative in some vacuum because most people in a competitive society have to work hard or they sink. So that sort of goes without saying. White, black, brown, doesn't matter. People tend to work hard and do so in relatively similar numbers. But what did matter is that the government of the United States stepped in and created wealth for white folks. Big government did that. We need to understand that's where the Head Start comes from. And this thing goes back an awful long ways. Actually, it goes back to the colonies in the 1630s and 1640s. There was a program in place. My family actually took advantage of it when one of the branches came during that period. You may or may not have heard about it. Odds are not, because we don't talk about it in school. But it was this thing called the Head Right Program. Hold up, The Head Right Program was... The Head Right Program. And it, and it was funny. He said his family, this Edomite admitted, his family took advantage of it. He's going to explain what the Head Right uh, program is. Go ahead. It's a program that allowed male heads of household from England who came to the United States to claim 50 acres of land and the tools with which to work it for nothing. Just well, for making what was it there? America gave Europeans 50 acres of land. Every male of their household got 50 acres of land. Head right. That gives them the head start. Go ahead. Now you see, you give out 50 acres of land and some tools to black people and we call that a handout. We call that welfare. We might even call that reparations. 
You give out 50 acres of land and some tools to white folks, we call it nation building. See how that works? It's fascinating, the different kind of rhetoric that we use. Millions of acres of land were given out that way over a period of a very short period of time. Fast forward to the 1860s. Homestead Act of 1862 gets passed. What does it do? Homestead Act. Homestead Act of 1862 goes into the same thing. Go ahead. Gives out 240 million or more acres of land for virtually nothing to white families. People of color almost completely barred from being able to take advantage of it. 240 million acres of virtually free land. That, the free market can't do that. Let's just at least agree on that. The, the, the small government can't do that. The market cannot take other people's land and give it to you. Right? Only a very large government with guns is capable of doing that. Mm. And that's what happened, of course, because this had been somebody else's land before, and then it got taken and redistributed. And yet what's interesting is I haven't seen a single one of the families, because there are 20 million white folks in this country today, some estimate as many as 50 million, but at least 20 million, who are living, who are the direct descendants of those people who got Homestead Act benefits, many millions of them living on that land, living on those ranches, living on those farms, living Stop. in those... You know what's interesting about, he said there's 20 million white people that took advantage of that, but none of them admit this, and he said they don't talk about it in school. They'll tell black people that, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, you stole our boots. <laughs> yeah, your shoestrings, you stole our boots and our shoestrings. So this is what they have done. And this is what Assyria did. This is also what the corrupt, I'm just showing you the corruptness of laws. Read verse one and two again, Isaiah 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Verse 1. So it first goes into our people, the leaders of Israel. That's what I want to make that clear here. Go ahead. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that write grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. So now watch this. Get Job 11 verse 6. Y'all should be familiar with Job 11 verse 6. Just want to show you something. Always remember this and consider this in your studies, in your reading, your four chapters every day. Job. Y'all are reading four chapters every day. Go ahead. Job chapter 11, verse 6. Come on. And that he would shew thee the secrets of wisdom. God will show us the secret of wisdom. Go ahead. That they are double. See that part right there? That they are doubles. Many of the scriptures have dual meaning, double meaning. Although it may be talking about, for example, Assyria or even our people, we can use these precepts that may fit us at that time or Assyria. It could also go for America at this time. So go back here. Isaiah 10, verse 1 and 2 again. Everybody understand what I'm going over so far, right? I don't want y'all to be lost. Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. And that right grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. So now we could use America does this very same thing with their unjust laws. However, when you keep it in a cultural context, our people were doing this. We were still in the land under Isaiah. Watch what happens. Verse three. Verse three. And what will ye do in the day of visitation? And in the desolation which shall come from far. So the Lord said, I'm going to bring destruction on you Israelites from far. He's talking about Assyria coming. Go ahead. To whom will ye flee for help? Who are you going to run for help for? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do when they come for you? Go ahead. And where will ye leave your glory? And where will you leave your glory? Go ahead. Without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners. See that? The Lord says, without me, you're going to bow down under the prisoners. Go ahead. And they shall fall under the slain. Mm -hmm. For all this is his hang anger not turned away. The Lord was very angry with us. Very. But his hand is stretched out still. Come on. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. See that? O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. So here in Isaiah 10, the Lord was letting the Israelites know through Isaiah that Assyria was coming. Why? Because Israel, we was wicked as hell. Go ahead. And the staff in their hand is mine indignation. So note it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff of their hand is in mine indignation. Watch this. Get I, Psalm 17, verse 13 and 14. This is what uh, was said in the spirit in the book of Psalms. Psalms 17, verse 13 and 14. 
17, verse 13 and 14. Psalms chapter 17, verse 13. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked. Deliver my soul from the wicked. Which is thy sword. You see that, which is thy sword. So the Lord uses wicked nations to come against us. That's the sword. He uses these nations like a sword. So during the time of Isaiah 10, he's talking about Assyria being that rod of correction for us. In this day and age, it's America. It's the so-called white man. Verse 14. Verse 14. From men which are thy hand. See that? From men which are thy hand. Go ahead. O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. Mm -hmm. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. Let's go back to Isaiah 10. What verse you at? Verse 6 now. Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 6. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. Stop! I will send him, I will send Assyria against a hypocritical nation. Why does the Lord call us hypocritical? Because we had the word of God, we read the word of God, but we would not apply the word of God. And this is what Deacon Malachi was talking about today in class, especially when it comes to marriage. We will have the scriptures, do this, do that, don't do this other thing. And what will people do? I'm going to do what the Bible says, don't do. That's a hypocrite for you. That's what the Lord says, um, I will send them against a hypocritical nation, men and women. Have the Bible, but will not do a daggone thing the Bible says. Go ahead. And against the people of my wrath. And against the people of my wrath. Go ahead. Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. God commanded Assyria to tread us down like the mire, like the mud in the streets. That's some heavy stuff right there. Hold on. Give me Isaiah 9, verse chapter before it. Isaiah 9, verse... 17. Isaiah 9, verse 17. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men. So the Lord ain't have no joy in our young men. Go ahead. Neither shall I have mercy on their fatherless and widows. And he said, I'm not going to have mercy on the fatherless. That's you young boys whose fathers died. Or the widows. That's the women whose husbands died. Go ahead. For everyone is an hypocrite. Wow. For everyone is an hypocrite. Go ahead. And an evildoer. And an evildoer. This he's talking about our people, the Israelites. Go ahead. And every mouth speaketh folly. Every mouth speaketh folly. That word folly translates to villain, villainy. Go ahead. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Okay, let's go back to verse 7 now. 10 verse 7. 10 verse 7. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth he his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Now watch this, verse 7. Howbeit he meaneth not so. Meaning what? I'm going to explain that. God chose the Assyrian kings to come against our people for judgment, to correct us so that we could get back in line with God's word, just like he's doing with us here in America. But it says, howbeit he, meaning Assyria, meaneth not so. Assyria didn't understand that God was using them as a whipping stick against us. That's what it means, how be it he, meaning Assyria, meaneth not so. Neither doth his heart think so. He doesn't think God is using him. Okay, then it says, but it is in his heart, meaning Assyria's heart, to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. That was verse 7, right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? This is what Assyria is saying. Are not my princes altogether kings? Go ahead. Is not Kalno as Carchemish? Now he's comparing cities. The cities that his predecessors had conquered, he's looking at new cities saying, I'm going to take these cities too. Go ahead. Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? See, that is not Samaria as Damascus because he had already had Damascus. Now he said Samaria is just like that. I'm going to take it too. Go ahead. As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria, shall I not as I have done unto Samaria? Now, look at verse, look at that verse. As my hand hath found, this is verse 10, as my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols. Kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. 
So we had graven images throughout the land. That's why when you read in the books of Kings and Chronicles, you read about the righteous kings tearing down the groves, tearing down the idols. Okay? Go ahead. Verse, Verse 11. 11. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols... So do to Jerusalem and her idols. So verse 11 verifies that by this time, Samaria was already conquered by Assyria. Now the campaign was against Judah, Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. You had Judah, Benjamin, and a remnant of the Levites. It says, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Go ahead. Wherefore, it shall come to pass... That when the Lord had performed... Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want to show you something about idols. That was verse 11, right? Look at Ezekiel 14. I'm going to show you something. I've often made the statement, according to Scripture, that idolatry is more than you have an a, uh, a image set up that you're worshiping. It goes much deeper than that. Because I'm sure everybody in here says they don't worship idols. But watch what the prophet Ezekiel Reveals Ezekiel 14, let's read 1 through 5. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, meaning in their minds. He and said they have idolatry in the mind. Go ahead. And put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Mm -hmm. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Should I be inquired of? Should I be questioned by these type of men? Go ahead. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart. That setteth up his idols in his heart. Keep that in mind. This is a mental thing. They have idolatry in the mind. Go ahead. And put up the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. God said, I'm going to deal with him according to the multitude of his idols. So, men and women, let's understand this. You may think you don't worship idols, but if you put anything ahead of the word of the Most High, that's idolatry. It could be a wife. It could be a spouse. I word it like that. A spouse you put ahead of the word of God. It could be your job. It could be a car. It could be sex. It could be children. Give me that in Colossians. I think it's 3 and 5 about covetousness, which is idolatry. Money. Some of you worship money. That's your God. That's idolatry. Is it 3 and 5? I'm not looking yes, at sir. it. That's it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Fornication. So he's going to name your members. He said mortify, meaning dead in these things. Fornication. Uncleanness. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Inordinate affection. Go ahead. Evil concupiscence. Evil sexual thoughts. And covetousness. And covetousness. Which is idolatry. Any form of covetousness is idolatry in the sight of God. Anything that you desire above what the word of God says to desire is idolatry. That could be money, job, a uh, uh, spouse, a uh, child. It could virtually be anything. That, but only you and the Lord knows what your idol is in your heart. Let's go back to Ezekiel 14. Well, I think we're in verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 5. That I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they all estranged, estranged from me through their idols. Because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Let's look at John 4 and 20. John chapter 4 and verse 20. The book of John, chapter 4 and verse 20. Our fathers were... this is the Samaritan woman. Go ahead. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, meaning this was, what's the name of this mountain over here? Uh, was it Hebron? I forgot the name of this mountain, but I'll get to it later on. It'll come back to me. Go ahead. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You Jews say that 
Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Why? What does that mean? 70 AD was coming. Christ was prophesying here in verse 21 that the Romans was coming to destroy the land of Israel. So you wouldn't be worshiping in that mountain where the Samaritans was worshiping or in Jerusalem. That's what verse 21 is saying. Go ahead. Ye worship, ye know not what. Christ said, you worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. When it says, for salvation is of the Jews, it means salvation is coming from Judah. That's what he's saying. Get that in Psalm 76, verse 1, to prove that. Psalm 76, verse 1. So he said, for salvation is of the Jews, meaning salvation is of Judah. Christ was from what tribe? That's right. Never forget that thing. Go ahead. Psalms chapter 76, verse 1. In Judah is God known. You see that? That's talking about Christ. In Judah is God known. And this is what Christ was telling the Samaritan woman. Because remember, there was that split. Ephraim and them didn't deal with Southern King. We ain't dealing with y'all. Christ said, listen, salvation is of the Jews. If you want the kingdom, you got to come this way. That's why when you read further down and, and go back to John 4. Okay, get back to uh, John 4, verse 24. John, chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Is that verse 20? I'm sorry, verse 25. Go verse ahead. 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith, saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse Christ revealed, he said, I'm he. I am the Messiah. I'm the one that's going to give salvation. Now, when you go to, now here's the mountain, Deuteronomy 11. It took me a few seconds. Deuteronomy 11, 29 tells you, remember there were two mountains when we came out of the wilderness. Half Israel stood upon one mountain to give the blessings. Another group of Israelites went on the other mountain to give the curse. Deuteronomy 11, verse 29. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. That's the mountain right there that the woman was standing in. Go ahead. And the curse upon Mount Ebal. Right. So it was Mount Gerizim when a Samaritan woman was making reference to. I appreciate you, uh, Ariel. I do appreciate you. Thank you. Took me a second. It'll come back, come back. Go back to um, Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 12. The book of Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord had performed his whole work upon Mount Zion. You know what it means by performed his whole work? Meaning Deuteronomy 28. 15 through 68 is his whole work. When uh, he has destroyed Israel. That's his whole work. Read it again. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord had performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. So he says, when I finish with Jerusalem and Israel, I'm going to deal with Assyria. Watch this precept. Jeremiah 25, verse 29. Jeremiah 25, verse 29. Here's a precept. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 29. For lo, I, bring to, I begin to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. That's Jerusalem. And should ye be utterly unpunished? And should you other nations be utterly unpunished? Go ahead. Ye shall not be unpunished. You shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. I'm going to bring judgment on all nations on the earth. Saith the Lord of hosts. This verse is heavy. Because many times we're on the street and people try to give Europeans a pass for slavery. And we say, did not the righteous Israelites such as Daniel go into slavery? They go, yeah. Did not the righteous man Ezekiel go into slavery? Yes. And many others. Mordecai. Okay. 
there are many of the forefathers that you read about who went into Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Daniel, all of these guys, the three, uh, Mishael, Azariah, uh, uh, Hananiah, uh, they all went into slavery. So then we say, so if the righteous Israelites and all Israelites went into slavery, why do Europeans get a pass? I want you to think about that a second. All the righteous men and women in Israel went into slavery, but Caucasians, Edomites get a pass? No, brothers, no sisters. Nobody gets a pass. That's what Jeremiah 25, read verse 29 once again. This is what he's saying. Verse 29, for lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Should you other nations be utterly unpunished? I'm punishing my own people. And you think you're going to get away? Go ahead. Ye shall not be unpunished. You shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. I'm going to get all the nations, saith the Lord of hosts. We used to scream black power while Haram was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone, 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.